Um, Henry, can you hear me before we get started? Hi, Yumana. Um, Hi. Hi, Josh. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, it's my pleasure. I think that, <laughs> plan is that Henry will be running this, and I think we're going to be live in a moment now. We're live now. Okay, good. <clears throat> Welcome everyone to our BME seminar series hosted by the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Columbia University. My name is Henry Hess and I'm a professor of biomedical engineering here at Columbia. In terms of today's format, our speaker will present for approximately 40 to 45 minutes and we will leave 15 minutes off at the end for Q&A. Throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, not the chat, to submit your questions. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session at the end. Today, we're excited to welcome Professor Yamuna Krishna. Professor Krishnan is working at the Department of Chemistry at the University of Chicago since 2014. She received her a PhD in organic chemistry in 2002 from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore and was a 1851 research fellow at the University of Cambridge in the UK. Her research group pioneered the use of DNA nanotechnology to study living cells and taking DNA nanotechnology into the world of precision medicine. She was featured on cells top 40 under 40 scientists that are shaping current and future trends in biology and the LSDP's top 100. Welcome, Yamuna. Thank you, Henry. I guess I, I share my screen now, uh, so give me a minute. Uh, share screen. Uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so, Henry, thank you so much for this invitation and also for allowing me to do this virtually. And I'm looking forward to the days when we can like put this pandemic behind us and meet old friends and, and renew our ties. And our lab, as you know, is you know, identified with uh, developing a DNA-based technology that has sort of enabled us to reveal the chemical contents of organelles in live cells and live organisms. But quietly over this pandemic, we reached an inflection point where this technology seems to be morphing into something that seems to have uh, potential for immunomodulation uh, across cancers. And so you may notice that I changed uh, the title of my talk at the last minute and I, and I want to explain why. You see, when I started building out this technology in 2009, I didn't envisage being where we are now. And in fact, I actually remember uh, on, on Monday, that a particular talk in 2012, someone asked me, you know, can you use this platform for drug delivery? And I distinctly remember <laughs> saying into the mic, Sorry, I refuse to do anything useful. I just want to learn how cells work and I'm not here to fix them. I said, clearly I was young and foolish, right? <laughs> so, uh, so usually in my seminars, I talk about one study and I discuss one new thing I learned, but after some reflection over the past week, I thought today I'll try and take you along the journey of how a platform that we built to actually discover new biology mutated into something that has a therapeutic potential. And so when I started my lab back in India, as the only chemist in an institute full of biologists in 2005, I wanted to know the answer to a fundamental question that really had no utility to either myself or anyone else. And that question uh, has led us to developing a way to deliver molecules to specific organelles in specific immune cells and turn cold tumors hot. So I want to detail this metamorphosis by sort of stitching together some of the key inflection points and so really try to feel out the arc that connects uh, blue sky exploration uh, to something useful. And so this simple minded question was, uh, why do sequences that are cytosine rich uh, form uh, a weird structure that is a tetramer? Uh, and uh, it turned out that these structures were pH sensitive. And I asked, you know, whether we could use uh, this pH sensitivity to create a pH sensitive reporter uh, for a solution pH. Uh, and you'll see that at each point, the answer 
is is the, to the question uh, turned out to be yes, uh, which motivated another uh, sort of weird follow up question. So, having found that we could really make a pH reporter that could a test solution pH, a report uh, uh, very accurate, uh, uh, very accurately solution pH, we asked whether it could do the same thing inside an organelle of a live cell. Uh, and again, when we found that it worked, we then asked, instead of doing this in a uh, cell culture, can it actually report pH inside a cell that's present inside a living organism? Uh, thereafter, when we found this was this was uh, this was true, we wondered whether we could send a DNA device to uh, any organelle of choice. Could we reroute these devices uh, to um, to to map uh, uh, organelle lumens in a variety of different uh, tissues and 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 other organelles? Uh, the second question that we asked, and these were more or less ongoing at the same time, was can we build maps of organelles uh, and sort of build chemical maps, which are you know, beyond pH, you know, other ions. Uh, and having done that, we then asked, well, we have these exciting uh, chemical maps. Um, uh, is there any significance to them? Uh, does it reflect the uh, organelle state in some way? Uh, and very recently, we found that it in fact did so. And we wondered whether if you explicitly change cell state, can you, organal state, can you change the state of the cell? And if you can change the state of the cell, can you actually change the biology of the organism by influencing its physiology? And so uh, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the simple minded question, uh, which was, uh, you know, I just want to say that in, in that journey, if we had not asked, any of the intermediate questions, especially not this uh, very simple-minded question right in the beginning, we wouldn't be where we are today. Uh, so this unusual structure is a four-stranded structure based on DNA called an I motif that is comprised only of cytosine. Uh, and two cytosines basically pick up a proton between them forming a C, C plus base pair. And a run of such Cs can actually cause a duplex to dimerize and two such duplexes can intercalate to give you a tetraplex. And my simple-minded question when I started my job was, why is this structure four-stranded? Given that in a duplex, all the bases are fully paired, so why should this further dimerize? So completing that study helped my first graduate student, Shovik, and me uh, to become familiar with the dimensions of the I motif, and which, of course, uh, would form only under acidic conditions. And so we wondered, you know, can you use it to make a pH sensor? So we designed an assembly, uh, a DNA-based assembly with a C-rich strand that could fold up into an I motif at acidic conditions, but under neutral pH, it would extend in this, uh, it would exist in this extended state. And we stuck on two fluorescent dyes, one green, one red, that act like a fret pair. And when the basically where the distance between these two guys are small, you have low green fluorescence, high red fluorescence. And when they're far apart, it's the opposite. So if you take the ratio of red to green fluorescence of this assembly as a function of solution pH, uh, we found that it's a very beautiful reporter of uh, solution pH in the uh, acidic regime, in this linear regime, right? Uh, and so the environment, so I used to, uh, my, I started my job in a, in a biology institute where I happened to be the only chemist. And the environment of this sort of biology-centered institute was actually responsible for the next unpredictable direction. <laughs> and there was a strong school of endocytosis around. And I became aware that you know, all endosomes inside cells were not alike, uh, that an endosome actually starts out life as an early endosome that then undergoes a series of maturation steps uh, to finally become a lysosome. And all the while, the pH inside the organelle becomes more and more acidic. And I wondered whether we could use our pH sensor to follow this process. So fortunately, I could persuade Jovic to try it. He was skeptical, but the moment he saw the first results, like he was off to the races and I was basically following and he taught me everything that I would later need to know. So in a nutshell, what he found was that if he added a DNA nano device, it would bind a protein on the cell surface called a scavenger receptor. And this would then drag your DNA devices into an early endosome 
that then matured into a late endosome and then a lysosome. And here's an image of uh, some endosomes uh, inside a coelomocyte, uh, uh, inside a cell that uh, contains some of our DNA nano, nano devices. Uh, using a fluorescence microscope, you can take an image of the green fluorophore, that's the green image that you see here, and one of the red fluorophore. And if you compute the ratio of the green intensity over the red intensity at both images at every pixel, uh, and you can convert it into a into a uh, you know into a uh, sort of pseudo color map uh, where the color uh, uh, sort of matches uh, is proportional to uh, uh, um, the the ratio that you get. You basically generate a heat map of the cell uh, where blue is sort of uh, acidic pH and the more red it is, it, the more neutral the pH is. And so using this pH reporting nano device, we tracked how the luminal pH inside an endosome changed as it matured. And the surprise in all of this was that the performance of the nano device inside a glass cuvette uh, shown in red um, and that of uh, its performance inside a living cell shown in blue were nearly identical. And this means that our DNA nano devices were not interfering with nor being interfered with uh, the cell's own uh, networks of DNA control. It was behaving like a true uh, passive reporter. So I meanwhile struck up a friendship with a worm geneticist, Sandhya Kaushika, and we wondered whether these devices could function inside a live cell that was inside a whole animal as opposed to cells in a Petri dish. So Sunaina, who was a geneticist, joined me exactly when I was thinking about this. And together we three showed that if you inject uh, DNA nano devices into worms, they went and labeled only one particular cell type, and these are called coelomocytes. And these were these. This was because these cells had loads of scavenger receptors, and endocytosis is on overdrive uh, in these cells. And so you see two coelomocytes here. Uh, uh, where their lysosomes are uh, containing our DNA nano devices. Here, the lysosomes are marked with GFP and our DNA devices have a red fluorophore. And at this time, I was very excited that the DNA nano devices marked exclusively one set of cells, but I didn't really start appreciating its importance till much later. In any case, here too, we could watch these endosomes mature and map out the pH. But again, what struck me was that if you look at device performance, Inside an endosome of a cell, uh, inside a live animal, and that's shown in blue, it is virtually identical to that inside a glass cuvette, and that's in red. Again, showing that these are autonomous and non-interfering reporters. So it was very clear, right, that if DNA devices found the right receptor, they would end up in a specific target organelle. Like if it bound the scavenger receptor, then it'll end up finally in the lysosome. So Shovik then showed that if he made a DNA device that bound a different protein on the cell surface that was destined for a different organelle, he could reroute DNA devices to other organelles like the Golgi or the recycling endosome. All he needed to do was to find a protein that could act like a shuttle protein between the cell surface and the organelle. It had to have high enough abundance on the target organelle and just enough abundance on the cell surface. So then if you attach a molecular motif onto your DNA nano device, it can latch onto the part of the shuttle protein that is exposed to the outside of the cell. Then the shuttling process is what will enrich your DNA nano devices inside your target organelle. So, um, oops. so if you recall, when we injected our DNA nano devices into worms, it ended up in lysosomes of coelomocytes because that is the default pathway, right? So when we found that DNA nano devices could be rerouted to other organelles uh, in cell culture, Santhya and I wondered whether we could now reroute them to label her favorite cells, which are neurons instead. Uh, our attempts didn't work at the time, mainly because the genetic tools in C. elegans then were not yet sophisticated enough. And I reactivated the same strategy five years later after I moved to University of Chicago with another uh, local worm geneticist uh, whose name is pa Pascalus Kratzios. And uh, together we showed that we could indeed take DNA nano devices and reroute them to lysosomes in neurons, 
uh, as well as uh, the gut. Okay, so uh, the idea itself was essentially unchanged as conceived of by Sandhya and me, and this is the idea. We fused a DNA binding protein, let's call it uh, 9E, and that's this blue thing here, uh, to a cell surface receptor. Uh, and we used it, uh, you know, we expressed this, uh, this protein under a specific promoter that would express it only on the plasma membrane of neurons and no other cell type. These are called tissue specific promoters. So if you then inject nano devices into the pseudocelom of, a, of such a worm, they will exclusively label only the neuron uh, membrane surface, uh, so the, the cell membrane of, of neurons. So great, you can have cellular level specificity, but can you get organelle level specificity? And so if you fuse this protein 9E to a protein like say synaptobrevin, which is 5% on the plasma membrane, and largely present in endolysosomes. And if you can express this fusion protein uh, in specific neurons using the same tool, these tissue specific promoters, you can even choose what kind of neuron you want to send it to, like the cholinergic neurons or the glutamatergic neurons, by choosing to express it under the right promoter. And Pasalis was one of those uh, who discovered some of these pro promoters for specific neuronal subsets, and we use these. So if you inject DNA nano devices into the pseudocelom of such worms that are expressing this fusion protein in a subset of neurons, then you can label endolysosomes only in those sets of neurons. And so we're here we're using this sort of artificial synthetic DNA binding protein that we pulled out using a phage display screen. Uh, and we wondered, you know, can you achieve such tissue specific labeling or, and organelle specific labeling even without genetic modification? So for example, gut cells, right? They express an RNA binding protein uh, called SID2. And this is one of the reasons why RNAi works so well in worms, right? So if you attach a ligand for SID2, like a double-stranded RNA, which is about 50 to 100 base pairs long to a DNA nano device, then this nano device will nicely now label uh, lysosomal relate, lysosome related organelles uh, or lysosomes uh, in this tissue, in gut cells. So I then spent quite some time looking for molecular systems that could achieve both tissue specificity as well as organelle level precision when they are externally introduced into a multicellular organism. Uh, and I failed to find any, but I found a few that do so with only tissue level precision, uh, precision and I include those here. Uh, GFP actually can achieve this precision, but GFP has to be genetically encoded, right? That you can express it in a specific organelle uh, of a specific cell type. Uh, but again, it has to be genetically encoded. Natural or synthetic viruses, these can achieve both cellular and subcellular level precision. So you can see that you know, DNA nanodevices are now amongst a sort of vanishingly small number of molecular scaffolds with which one can achieve very high precision uh, biological uh, targeting. Uh, so on the one hand is where you can measure, right? where you can send our probes. And the other is what can you measure? And as all of this was going on, we were wondering, you know, can we map chemicals other than protons inside organelles? Because you see, chemists had discovered uh, small molecules that can fluoresce upon binding specific ions or reactive species, uh, such as superoxide or, or nitric oxide. Uh, people like Chris Chang and, and Nagano uh, come to mind. Uh, but if you add these, uh, these dyes to cells, they generally diffuse throughout the cell and paint the whole cell. And you can't get information on how much uh, and where your chemical of interest is, right? So with GFP, you can mark your organelle of interest inside a cell, but you're very limited in terms of the chemical space that you can map. You can do pH possibly, maybe calcium, uh, but <laughs> you're quite uh, limited in terms of um, chemical uh, heat maps. So with DNA, we reasoned, you know, you can localize a detector probe to a specific organelle 
Uh, and because DNA duplexes are always in a one is to one stoichiometry, you can attach another dye as an unchanging reference signal. Now the ratio between the detector and the reference suddenly turns a qualitative or a semi-quantitative signal into a quantitative measure. And also because a DNA device is quite big and, and, uh, and uh, negatively charged, it's not going to punch a hole through the membrane of an organelle and jump out and, and uh, you know, so it's actually, you have robust spatial localization. And so given this, we should be able to measure and get heat maps uh, within uh, of chemicals within organelles. Then there was a burst of sensors from the lab showing that this was in fact possible. And it happened only because there was a group of, you know, <laughs> really sort of highly creative and almost joyously crazy people, all of them who joined at the same time and sort of fed off each other's uh, enthusiasm. So Sonali and, and Kasturi um, showed that you could use uh, chloride sensitive dye to map chloride. Uh, Malik, Juni and Anish showed that you could map reactive species uh, like reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species. Anand showed that you could uh, measure absolute membrane potential in organelles. And Kaho showed that you could quantitate, you can literally do uh, enzyme kinetics, um, quantitate enzyme cleavage uh, inside organelles. So I'll discuss one example of some of these sensors and I'll talk uh, so you can see, you might be able to envisage how the rest work. Uh, and I'll discuss Kasturi's sensor for calcium, you know, because for 40 years, biologists have always wanted to measure calcium inside lysosomes, except they couldn't because the lysosome is highly acidic. And every calcium sensor we know fails under acidic conditions because they all work by binding calcium through carboxylate groups that get protonated when the acidity is high, right? So you basically cannot use any calcium sensor to map calcium and lysosomes because the dyes cross react with uh, the pH, right? Solution pH. So we turned the problem on its head and we asked, you know, if you take a duplex with the one is to one ratio of a calcium sensitive dye that glows, uh, I don't know, orange and uh, a reference dye that glows red, then the ratio of orange to red will be dependent only on two things, right? Calcium and pH. The problem that had the biologists running in the opposite direction is that you can't actually deconvolute uh, the contribution of pH or calcium to the orange signal. But we have a pH sensor. If you append a pH sensor onto the system, you can measure pH at that exact same location. So if you know exactly how this orange guy's uh, pH sensing characteristics, uh, calcium sensing characteristics are gonna change as a function of pH, then you will know the precise contribution of calcium to this orange guy's fluorescence. And so uh, what we did was, uh, why is this thing not clicking? Uh, so what we did was we made a DNA nano device that carried uh, a dye that was sensitive to calcium called ROD5F. Uh, and um, this ratio is basically a function uh, of ROD5F versus say uh, Alexa 647. This O by R ratio, uh, uh, we were able to track it for every single value of uh, pH and calcium. Uh, and so we know exactly how this is going to behave uh, at any point uh, for any contribution of calcium and pH. So uh, I think there is something wrong with this. Okay, so um, I just wanted to show you, here are the first maps of uh, acidic calcium stores in cells. Actually, let me just go back one. So you'll see that here itself, you can see that at every pH, the affinity for this calcium dye is changing uh, as a function of solution pH, right? And that you can plot here. So here are the first maps of acidic calcium uh, inside uh, C lomocytes of C elegans. And here's how we obtain them. I mean, I told you how we can get a D by A map, right? Uh, and you know exactly how the D by A depends on pH. And so uh, uh, you can plug in this equation and convert this map into a pH map. I just showed you how the pH depends on the KD, uh, on the affinity for the calcium uh, dye. And so you can basically convert this pH map into a KD map. And now if you take the product of the KD map versus the O by R map, so you're basically introducing a pH correction factor, you can basically extract out the map of absolute calcium. And so the reason I'm taking some time to show you this, right, is because these are the first quantitative calcium maps in any organelle. 
the Rod family of dyes, as you know, has <laughs> been known for 30 years, thanks to Roger Chen. pH sensors have been known for even longer, like 130 years. I think uh, Eli Mechnikov made the first pH measurement uh, inside an organelle. Uh, and we've known for 40 years that it's important to measure calcium inside lysosomes. Uh, and we've known about endocytic tracers for longer than I've been alive. So despite having all of these working parts, right, these maps could only be visualized by bringing a DNA duplex into the table uh, because of the stoichiometric precision with which you can display a rod sensitive, uh, calcium sensitive uh, dye like a rod dye, a pH sensor, uh, uh, a normalizing dye, and the ability of the entire DNA duplex to act like an endocytic tracer. Okay, so we then asked whether the chemical map of an organelle had any connection to the state of the organelle or its function. And if it did, then as a corollary, we could ask, you know, what would happen if we exclusively modulated the state of the organelle? Could we change organelle function? and thereby affect the function of the cell overall. So here's the system, right? We'll, the organelle we will look at is the lysosome and the lysosome can exist in two different states. One state is normally vesicular, but sometimes in immune cells, if that cell is either inflamed or it's starving, these lysosomes can become you know, long tubules. And so the immune cell we look at are called macrophages which as you know, uh, translates uh, into big eater and the functional part of a big eater is its stomach and the lysosomes are generally thought of as a stomach of the cell. They digest nutrients that the cell endocytoses and then send the rest, uh, send it out to the, the digested bits uh, into the rest of the cell, right? So, uh, so give me a, little, a minute to tell you what I'm attempting to test and, and I'll, I'll take you through my thought process. So biologists have already shown that cell state is connected to cell function. This is nothing new, right? Let's take an immune cell in its resting state. If it is starving, it amplifies a process called autophagy where the lysosome is basically cannibalizing older parts of the cell from within in an effort to produce a starving cell with building blocks uh, to make new proteins, right? And this requires the cell to adopt a specific transcription program. And the state right, that the cell is in is a different state from the resting state. So on the other hand, if the in your same immune cell, this resting cell encounters a pathogen, it will activate inflammation, right? This sets off a different set of transcription uh, program for immune activation and the cell adopts this sort of inflamed or activated state. And we know that organelles in the cell uh, in, under each situation, they rise to meet each of these challenges and they change their function to help drive the cell's overall new function, right? So during autophagy or inflammation, it is the lysosome in immune cells that's either sensing uh, starvation, where it's like, oh, there's nothing coming in, <laughs> you know, I'm starving, or senses the pathogen, which is, hello, look at what I swallowed, and sends these signals to the nucleus to initiate signaling. Okay. And we know that biologists like uh, Sergio Grinstein, Juan Bonifacino, uh, David Sabatini have all shown that the nature of li the lysosome itself changes in each of these states. So what I'm trying to ask is the reverse, right? Is there a direct connection? Uh, can organelle state lie upstream of cell state, right? as well, right? It, we know that it will respond to what the cell is, nucleus is demanding. Can the organelle dictate to the nucleus? That's what we are asking. So we know that there must be some feedback between the nucleus and the lysosome, right? Because once the pathogen is cleared or once nutrients become available, the lysosome has to communicate that change in state to the nucleus and switch, make the cell switch back to its resting state, right? And reset that uh, transcription program. So we first test whether if we explicitly change the organelle state, like say morphology, does it change the chemical and biochemical properties of the organelle? And if so, can we change cell state or cell behavior? Okay. So Bhavya in my lab designed a DNA nano device that bound uh, co-proteins on the cell surface. Uh, and she called this device Tudor because she wanted to transport DNA nano devices to the ER. 
Uh, instead, she found that when she added it to macrophages, it kickstarted a different signaling pathway that caused these very nice uh, uh, spherical lysosomes to tubulate into, uh, into these elongated uh, tubular lysosomes. So not one to be disheartened, you know, Bhavya wondered, you know, is there any chemical difference in the lumen between these vesicular lysosomes and these tubular lysosomes? I mean, why does the cell need two different kinds of shapes of the same organelle? Uh, and so what she found was that all along the tubular lysosomes, there was a pH gradient. And in the opposite direction, there was a calcium gradient. And so one end of the tubular lysosome had high calcium and low acidity, and the other end had high acidity and low calcium. And this gradient had been theoretically postulated uh, by Professor Botello in Canada, but using our DNA nano devices, we were able to provide the first experimental proof of it. Even more interesting was that when she looked at proteolysis uh, or degradation by enzymes such as cathepsin, uh, Bhavya found that it was higher in these spherical uh, lysosomes and degradation was much lower in these tubular lysosomes. Uh, so Bhavya also found later that when she explicitly tubulated lysosomes with her device called Tudor, it set off this, this signaling cascade that was set off uh, also resulted in more amount of MMP9 being secreted. Uh, by this macrophage. The, note that this is all resting macrophages, right? And then there is this positive feedback where more MMP9 secretion causes more tubulation uh, that again secretes even more MMP9. And so this makes the cell much more phagocytic, right? Much more uh, sort of bitey or gulpy, uh, yet without setting off either autophagy or inflammation. So you can see here that you can change cell behavior by explicitly triggering um, uh, an organelle to change from its, its state uh, from vesicular to uh, tubular. Okay, so now at, at about this time, uh, Kasturi and Bhavya were making a DNA nano device to measure cathepsin activity uh, inside lysosomes of macrophages. Uh, a colleague uh, on the floor above us, uh, Lev Becker, had been measuring protein content in macrophages. And macrophages, as many of you know, they occupy two states. Uh, they occupy many states. Uh, two, I will describe two of them here. One state is called M1, and I call them loudmouths. They just take in food, half eat it, spit it out, uh, smear it all over their face and say, look everyone at what I, look at what I ate. And this is great for antigen presentation and T cell activation. Uh, and using proteomics, Lev found, Lev's uh, 11 student Chang found that uh, macrophages, these M1 type, they had low cathepsins. And then you have the M2 state, right? And these guys are like, Shh, I don't want anyone to know what I just ate because I just ate self-antigen. So basically it takes in cargo and degrades it all the way down to its building blocks and then recycles it in the cell. Um, and what uh, Chang and uh, Lev found was M2 macrophages had very high levels of cathepsin. So Kasturi used a DNA-based cathepsin sensor and found that this high cathepsin activity was confined to lysosomes. And uh, since we were already sending DNA devices to <laughs> lysosomes tissue specifically, Lev asked us, you know, can you make a DNA nano device which has a cathepsin inhibitor? And then we can inhibit cathepsin in the lysosome and, and, and cure cancer. At which point I told him, yeah, that's not happening. Uh, that's not going to work. Uh, and I'm so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so he then... Um, uh, so I'll, I'll first tell you about Lev's logic. I'll then tell you why I said no. Uh, and then I'll tell you why I was wrong. Uh, so 50% of the cells in a tumor are tumor-associated macrophages or TAMs, right? You and I produce cancer cells every day, but our T cells uh, take care and, of these cancer cells and, and kill them. Uh, <clears throat> so the the presence of a tumor basically indicates a failure of your immune system, right? That your T cells have failed to see the tumor cell. And so the reason why that happens, uh, um, Lev reasoned, was that 
uh, tumors in TAMS are the super hungry M2 type, and they must be gobbling up every bit of dead or dying tumor cell and preventing the presentation of antigen uh, to T cells. So that's why I left thought that if we inhibited catepsin in lysosomes of these M2 TAMs with one of our organelle targeted nanodevices, then they won't over digest antigens. They will behave, start behaving like uh, M1s and spit out some undigested antigen and allow the T cells to actually see the tumor. So the reason I said no, is that there's no reason to think that if you inject a DNA nanodevice, that it's only going to go to TAMs and no other tissue macrophages, right? Second, there's no reason to think that you'll be able to deliver enough to shut off catepsin activity adequately, right? If you want to image something, you just need to get a few molecules there. You, you have very highly sensitive cameras. You can catch them. You can image them. There's no problem. For a therapeutic effect, you really need to have enough that reaches the destination and we can't guarantee that at all. So thankfully, Lev didn't give up on us. He just went out and got us more data to convince us. Uh, and this is that data. So TFEB is a master regulator that is responsible for lysosome biogenesis, right? It's needed to produce lysosomes. So he used a TFAB knockout mouse where there are a reduced number of lysosomes. So in this way, he genetically lowered the overall degradation by lysosomes across all macrophages, right? All macrophages in that, in that poor mouse. Anyway, and in three different cancer models, he showed that this prevented tumor growth. And the reason that it prevented tumor growth was the, that there was more effective recruitment of T cells to uh, the tumor as because uh, TAMs were presenting uh, more antigen to the T cells. So Kasturi then ma made a DNA nano device with a, catepsin with a catepsin inhibitor, as well as a tracking fluorophore, as you can see here. She and Chang injected into mice and <laughs> lo and behold, it went straight to lysosomes of only TAMs in tumors and no other cell type. And never in a month of Sundays would I have predicted this, right? So even though we had seen super specific macrophage targeting in zebrafish and in worms, I was very surprised uh, to see this uh, specific targeting of uh, TAMs so cleanly and in a complex higher organism like a mouse, which has many more types of max and many more diverse biological barriers. So then the rest of it went as Lev predicted. You know, the nano device went, it inhibited catepsins in the lysosomes of TAMs. Uh, and now with rocks in their stomach, you know, uh, this uncontrolled shredding of antigens by, by these uh, max had been transformed into you know, very polite uh, snipping. Uh, and uh, antigens are now displayed on the surface of TAMs, as you can see here, and T cells can indeed now start seeing the tumor uh, and you can see that uh, tumors fail to grow as much, right? But now, if you combine it with a treatment that causes tumor cells to die, like low-dose cytophosphamide, you are now supplying the TAMs with more tumor antigen. They are getting more antigen that's coming uh, to them uh, to digest and display. And here you see that tumors never even had a chance to grow. And people who've been in this business for a while uh, were quite excited when they saw this level of efficacy. And again, goes to show the mechanism is one where, you know, what is limiting here is the amount of antigen that, that is displayed. And if you can provide more of that antigen and at the same time have a uh, max sort of uh, where their stomachs are fairly full, uh, they are going to sort of hemi-digest antigens and, and present them better. Um, and so many of us are, are familiar, right, with this concept of drug targeting. You enrich a drug at the tissue of interest, a more drug becomes available at the site where it's needed, plus you have less side effects because it doesn't hit places where it's not needed. Um, and so given that many cellular processes are controlled at the level of organelles. And now we also see from our work that there's actually a direct line of communication between organelles and cell state. Uh, this makes me posit that there'll be a lot to be gained if we can achieve an additional level of drug targeting where 
we not only send drugs to specific cell types, but to specific organelles within those target cells. Um, and so I also <laughs> posit that we may all have to start viewing cells the way cell biologists always have, right? With all of their organelles, uh, if we are to solve the next uh, set of sort of currently intractable problems. And I've been very lucky to work with some incredible students and postdocs and collaborators. I've kind of tried to acknowledge them all along the way uh, here uh, so that we could transition smoothly into questions. And uh, hopefully I've been able to convince you that if even simple DNA duplexes that are programmed with a few small molecules can reveal something useful about biological systems, uh, then uh, the complex architectures that the rest of my field is creating uh, might be capable of uh, so much more. Uh, so with this, I'm going to stop and uh, I can't see any of the chat. So if anyone uh, reads the questions out to me, that'd be great. Yes, thank you, Yamuna, for this fantastic talk and for convincing me that cells are just people and <laughs> are controlled by their stomachs and not their brains. Yeah. Um, but before we get into the question, answer session, I just want to call everyone's attention to our upcoming events. Next Thursday, February 17, Columbia Engineering and Columbia Medicine will join together for the Columbia, or will join with Columbia BME to co-host our, our sixth annual Engineering and Medicine Symposium. Be sure to register at bme.columbia.edu if you haven't already. On Friday, February 20, Fifth, so in two weeks, we'll continue our BME seminar series with Professor Doug Weber from Carnegie Mellon University as he presents neuroprostheses for restoring sensory and motor function. So please follow us on social media to receive the latest updates. You can see our social media information on the slide. Okay, we have a few questions to get through, so we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. If we do not end up addressing your question, you can see our speaker's contact information on the slide, so please feel, to, feel free to reach out following the seminar. Good, let me start with the first question. Uh, Pilwal Lee is asking, I wonder how those pH sensitive DNA devices are affected by osmotic effects. Huh. So, <clears throat> So I think when you have uh, changes in osmolarity, right, it's really going to change uh, the concentration of your ion in that compartment. Uh, and then it would be able to report the concentration of that ion. So the reason I say this is we've just made sensors for both chloride as well as sodium, both of them heavily involved in osmolarity uh, changes. In, and you can see that when you have uh, sort of uh, things that perturb chloride and, and uh, sodium, organelles like the lysosome, it'll just become huge, right? So it's also partially osmotic effect. And then you can actually get, it'll report the concentration of that ion over there. So it doesn't, uh, uh, at least in, in the solution, I don't see, uh, I see this responding to osmolarity and showing you changes in concentrations due to osmolar changes. Okay, thank you, Yamuna. Um, Rodney Rothstein is saying, great talk. And does the acidity of the DNA nanobody after pH does alter the pH in any way? Could it be done with PNA? Uh -huh. So the second one I can always tell you, it can always be done with PNA. Uh, you know, all of this can be done with peptide nucleic acids, right? Uh, but PNA is actually expensive, <laughs> and it, but it also gives you much more stability, right? These are the two things. Uh, one is your DNA device will have a much higher half-life in the cell uh, because you know it takes a while to degrade anything which is non-biological, right? Um, but the thing is, you know, why do you need something so expensive? Um, if you, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the second thing. If you can achieve it with a smaller, uh, uh, cheaper device, then you might want to do that. Uh, the, what was the first part of the question? Oh, does it alter the pH in any way? Yes. So 
that i would say is um is unlikely to be the case because um you are looking at uh, changes so we've done experiments to find out actually how many dna nano devices might be in an organelle uh and it turns out to be uh, about 200 to 500 devices in an organelle now ph is something which is uniquely set by the lysosome right uh in terms of um the lysosome membrane you have all of these ion channels and transporters and exchangers and pumps which are on the membrane and they are they are on autopilot and whatever cargo you have inside it just has to be degraded right so a lysosome a cell uh, when it has taken in self dna or non self dna its job is to get rid of it right so uh, you have things like vatps vatps is a bull it doesn't care it'll just keep pumping as as much uh, Well, as many protons uh, as it's like the world bank right just give <laughs> whatever you need even if your cargo is taking up uh, some uh, some protons so what is more interesting in your question is you can have fluctuations in the lysosome uh, ph right as the lysosome is functioning and then it would be very easy, nice to see if we can use our ph thing to actually look at does the entry of any cargo into a lysosome change the lysosome's ph initially in the beginning right because lysosome also has to sense who has come in so i don't know whether i answered your question but this it was an interesting question it was my question but thank you um uh, except <laughs> on behalf of professor Um, Austin, Mala, Maria Hudok is asking, uh, is saying, thanks for this fascinating talk, Dr. Krishnan. I'm really excited to watch the future developments at this therapy heads towards the clinic. So now, beyond endosome and lysosome targeting, I was wondering what you envision as the next organelle to target. Beautiful question. Uh, two things. I have two things in mind. One is. the endoplasmic reticulum the er right uh, and we have ways to get there uh, we're working on it right now and i don't want to like uh, preempt anything but uh, let me just say that you know toxins like shiga toxin and cholera toxin many of them need to go to the er for their action right so this is also stuff which is coming from outside uh but you have to go to the er is is a hard problem because you have to go down a one way street the wrong way right everything is coming out of the er so there are ways by which you can do this and uh we're try, trying to see if we can learn take some lessons from toxins to send dna nano devices to the er because there you have sheet like er and tubular er and so these are connected spaces right and we seem to think that these spaces are likely to have very similar environments right because it's all connected but i would be very keen to see if there's actually differences in uh, sheet like er and tubular er i know that in my house uh, heating is good in one room <laughs> everything is connected right but there are some cold spaces in your home and some warm spaces in your home and so the er is likely to be like that and i would be very interested to see the heterogeneity that you have there uh so the other organelle that i'm thinking of are peroxisomes because if you can get into the er then you can access a whole number of other so till now we've been looking at sort of direct flights plasma membrane to the organelle right but if you you can access a whole load of new organelles if you say okay let's do hopping flights right let's go from uh let's let's use the golgi or uh you know the er or the recycling endosome or the late endosome as a small uh hopping flight where i reach here and then from here i go somewhere else i don't have to take a default pathway to the lysosome so yeah okay thank you for this interesting answer um an anonymous attendee is asking considering the specificity and diversity of ph based targeting which you presented would you have or would have you considered designing a computational model to further explore effects on other organelles that's a beautiful question so one of the things that i is so one of the things i really want to talk about right 
which we are heading towards now, is actually trying to see if we can develop an electrochemical model of an organelle membrane. And this is where we have reached, and this is what we want to do now, which I've talked about in multiple other places. But given that we can now measure ions inside an organelle, uh, and you can actually look at, uh, in a way you can actually look at transport of an ion across a membrane, right, inside an organelle. So Hodgkin and Huxley were able to develop this computational model of, uh, of the plasma membrane of neurons, um, uh, just looking at how ions were able to cross as a function of the membrane potential. We've just been able to show that organelles also have membrane potential. They also have, um, uh, what do you call, um, uh, ion channels and, uh, and uh, voltage-gated channels on their surface. So since we have the capacity to look at uh, ions inside uh, these lumens, we can actually start building a, uh, uh, an electrochemical model. So you're absolutely right. The, the advantage of using these DNA nano devices because they give us the value of, it's not a qualitative uh, image of an ion, right? You're getting numbers. So really the value of getting a number is developing a computational model of uh, the membrane. And that's where we're going. Uh, and uh, we welcome anyone who's interested in this problem to get in touch with us. Uh, we love to work with you uh, on this. Okay, thank you. Now, Rania Derani is asked, saying, very nice talk, thank you. Can you envisage tar targeting the mitochondrial intermembranous space? <laughs> Are you talking to my students? Uh, okay, so... Did you um... tell your students to ask questions? <laughs> no, no, so it's, it's funny because, you know... Um, uh, it's interesting that you ask this, um, using this technology, right? So every time I've given this talk, people ask me, can you target the nucleus in the mitochondria? And I've always said, no, I can't do it. Um, because, you know, these are the two organelles which are double membrane. Every other organelle has a single membrane, right? So any organelle which has two membranes surrounding it is actually a very privileged organelle to get into. But that said, uh, every time I've said we cannot do something, we go and do it. Uh, so we've just been able to find a way to send DNA devices to the mitochondria, except we don't know where in the mitochondria it is, right? Is it on the plasma membrane? Is it in the interluminal space? Is it in the matrix? No, no clue. So we're trying to find out where, <laughs> where in the mitochondria it is at the moment. That's a developing story. But uh, hope to be able to say something on that uh, soon. Okay, thank you. Maybe I'll take the privilege of asking the last question. Um, so how, how fast are the devices? Do they turn on and off on a millisecond or second time scale? How quick mm -hmm. can you see This is a good question. So um, the pH sensor that I showed you, right, whether we have this fancy change in uh, <laughs> shape, conformational change and things like that. Uh, that takes about five seconds to, to respond. So you can say that for that transition to occur, so you double that and you say response time is about 10 seconds, probably half a minute, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you can change it. You can increase the response time to now uh, by just putting a pH sensing die over there. And these respond in uh, microseconds and millisecond time scales. Our chloride sensor is collision uh, quenching. That is a microsecond time scale. Uh, same for many of these uh, dyes that we have, which are pre-quenched. The moment it, uh, um, it coordinates an ion, quenching is relieved. And this is an electronic process. Um, and so there as well, it's sort of like low milliseconds uh, time scale. So it's not going to be, I mean, if you, if you just say, okay, I don't want this fancy confirmation change, I just have dyes, uh, then, then your response time is probably not going to be limiting if you want to look at new biology, right? It's actually going to be limited by optics. How fast can you measure and get uh, an output? But the dyes won't be limiting. Yeah. 
So have you and ever seen? The question is, you know, does biology actually compute on that time scale? We don't know that, right? Uh, we don't know how fast biology, like what is the time scale that biology is sensing at the cellular level? Is it millisecond, or microsecond? We don't know that. Have you ever seen dynamic processes like calcium waves or something like that? Hmm. So we are now getting there slowly. So we've been doing sort of Mickey Mouse imaging with our uh, little IX83 and using very interesting probes. And now we just decided, okay, let's let's actually use a proper, uh, you know, have a microscope that matches the capabilities of our dyes. Um, and now we are actually going to start looking at real-time dynamics. We've been doing, you know, very uh, jittery kind of dynamics where you have a longer uh, time scales where you're looking at sort of, you don't have high enough time resolution, but you can see dynamics. Uh, but now you will start seeing things where you can actually watch the dynamics of ions inside these long tubules that I showed you. Those you can really capture beautiful fluctuations. So I think this is a very exciting uh, uh, time ahead of us where you can start looking at internal dynamics in an organism, right? Uh, um, yeah. So it's okay. certainly possible to do. Okay, great. Thank you. Two more questions. We have some late comers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, is asking, saying, thank you for an excellent talk. What is the stability of the DNA assembly and tubulated li lysosomes? Does MHC antigen presentation and consequent immune response change with time in vivo? Oh, that's interesting. So in vivo, I don't know. We've only looked at this in cells, right? Um, and Botello actually has shown that these tubular lysosomes are very important for showing out uh, MHC class two. Um, I mean, loading antigens and, and, and presenting them on the surface. Um, so that was one of, I mean, they've noticed tubular lysosomes for that reason. Uh, the mechanism of tubulation was already known. And because of that mechanism, they predicted that there must be this gradient, but then we found this gradient saying validating their mechanism. So this is known, but what they haven't shown yet is tubular lysosomes in vivo are responsible for more MHC presentation. That has not been shown yet, right? Um, uh, what was the rest of the question? Uh, you, what is the state stability of the DNA assembly? Of the DNA devices. So these DNA devices can, it depends on the, the context in which you are looking at, right? Sometimes it can be, have a half-life of say two hours inside a very activated lysosome of, uh, of a, <laughs> a real a professional phagocyte. But you can also have them uh, have half-lives of about nine hours in cells which are not used to having DNA devices in the lysosome, where the lysosomes are not that powerful. Um, and so in our systems, all our measurements are made within one hour. And, you know, it takes one hour to reach the lysosome. You make your measurement, you get out. Uh, so that, that, this is not a problem. Okay. Stability. So, yeah. Okay. Now the last question from Yanis Siligakis. Yeah. Yes. How do you know that the calcium concentration and the pH are decoupled and independent from each other? I never claimed oh. that. Yeah. So we have no idea, right, that these, that calcium and pH have to be decoupled. There is no earthly reason to think that is the case uh, in lysosomes. I'm just saying that this was the calcium gradient and in the opposite direction, there's a pH gradient. Now, there are proteins on lysosomes that are nothing but calcium proton exchangers. These have been postulated, but they've been looking for this calcium proton exchanger for the last 40 years. Nobody's been able to find it. Uh, but there is a mechanism where pH and calcium are coupled. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, we've found this molecule <laughs> right now. We are sitting and trying to revise the paper. Uh, uh, and that will actually show you that pH and calcium are dependent. At this present time, I can't say anything because there is no, that molecule is not there to show that pH and calcium are coupled. Um, but yes. Okay. Thank you very much for that.
detailed answer. That's and let's end it here. I would like to thank you again and thank everyone for attending this seminar. And we look forward to seeing uh, you all at our symposium next week. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you, Yamuna. Thank you. Thank you. It was really great.